All right, well, good morning, church. All right, what a great opportunity we have to come into the house of the Lord today and lift up the name of Jesus. So just by a hand clap of praise this morning, who all is going to help us do that? Will you do that with us? Amen. Amen. We just want to try to give back something to him that's worthy. You know, nothing that we do up here on stage will ever be worthy unless, unless the Spirit of the Lord just comes in and just inhabits our praises this morning. So that's what we're asking the Lord to do. If you will, let's stand together, and we're going to get started today, and we're going to talk, and we're going to sing about how great our God is. Amen. You just want to clap along this morning, feel free. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, and I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe that there's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move, oh praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Yes, you do. Just one touch, and I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch. My heart can't help but believe that There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes the way There's nothing that our God can do No, there's nothing that our God can do There's not a prison wall He can't break through Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. No. Sing this with me. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater peace, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, oh, let all agree, there's no power like the power of God. Right, give it all you got, church. I will believe. For greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, oh, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. And while he can't break through Oh, praise the name That makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do Oh 
give him all the honor and glory this morning. Amen. How many folks believe the words in that song? If there's nothing that our God can't do. Amen. And Lord, we need you this morning more than ever. If you know the words of this song, I pray you sing along with us. seated for just a moment. Well, amen. There is nothing that our God can't do, and because of that, we do need him, because there's a lot that we can't do. Have you figured that out? And so it's great to be in the house of the Lord and to worship him and to give him praise. It's good to see you all this morning. Everybody doing okay? All right. Glad I don't have any big groans, uh, but uh, either way, it's going to be it's going to be a great Sunday. Glad you're here today. If you're a guest here with us, so glad to have you. You might have noticed near you that there is a card that looks like this. This top scan will take you to a connection card. We'd be grateful if you filled that out. That helps us to connect with us, and so we're glad to do that. And I hope that you would do that for us as well. And so, uh, also this weekend on Saturday, we celebrated Veterans Day, and so I want to make sure that we give special tribute to them and honor them today. And so if you are a veteran that has served, I'm going to ask that you would stand and we're going to clap for you and and thank you so much for your service to our military. So if you're a a vet, thank you so much. (laughs) 
Amen. We, we have uh, much to be thankful for, and so I want to say a prayer and thank the Lord for our veterans as well as for him and what he's done for us. And so let's, let's pray together, and then we'll continue our worship. Father, we come before you, and we do thank you for those that have sacrificed so much in service to our country, Lord. We would not have the religious freedoms that we do have in this country if it were not for them, and I thank you so much for them. I pray you bless them, bless their families, and I just pray that this weekend would be a special weekend as we honor them, Lord. We have so much to be grateful for. Lord, I do also want to thank you for what you've done for us. I thank you for Jesus who sacrificed himself on the cross for our sins. God, we deserve your wrath. We deserve death and separation from our sins. But Lord, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us that we might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. For that, we are so grateful. And for that, we come into this place of worship, and we lift up our hands, and we sing out to you because you are worthy of our praise. And I pray today, if there's someone here that does not know Jesus as their Savior, God, I pray that the gospel would ring true in their heart, and that they would see that they are a sinner, but there is a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And I pray today they would repent of their sin and place their faith in Christ. God, your word has the power to save, the power to change lives. We've seen you do it, and we're going to ask that you would do it again today. We love you today, and we just pray that your name would be uplifted as we continue to sing. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Church, would you stand with us?
consecrated Lord to Thee. Amen. That's our prayer this morning, God. Amen. our prayer this morning. God, thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Congregation, you can be seated. If you're a part of Children's Church, you'll make your way forward and exit either to the right or to the left, and our workers will get you where you need to be. Thanks for everyone that helps in, in that ministry. I know that it's uh, something that's very important to us, is the uh, bringing up our children in the right way. Amen. Amen. Today, if you will, let's open our Bibles to the book of Job. The book of Job, I'm going to start in, ver- in chapter 40. Job chapter 40. In a minute, I'm going to read verse 6. 
Job 40. I'm going to read verses 6 through 14 here in just a moment. As you're turning there, I went to a corn maze the other day, and I felt like I was being stalked. It was a little eerie. So, have you ever felt like your, ma- your life was a little puzzling? Sometimes when we go through sufferings in this world, we are puzzled, we're confused. We don't know why these things are happening. And Job had those feelings in his own life. And what he wanted more than anything else is he wanted a chance where he could sit down and talk face-to-face with God. And he had that opportunity. Last time we met, last Sunday, we saw that God spoke to him and and revealed a lot of himself to Job. And today we're going to see his second speech. So God spoke two times to Job, and this is the second speech, starting in verse number 6. Job chapter 40, verse 6. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger, and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. Let's pray. Father, we love you today and we thank you for this word. And God, as we have an audience with you today, Lord, we're, we know we're in your presence. We know that this word is for us today. And God, I don't want this to be merely a word about you, but a word from you that encounters our very life situations. And I know that there are people in this room that are struggling. Some of them are going through some intense adversity. Some of them are going through things that only you know about. Maybe they're holding it in, internalizing it. But God, you know all things. And I pray today that as Job encountered the God of the whirlwind, I pray that we all would and that we would recognize your voice, and that we would fall at your feet and say, you are a holy God. And I pray that we would recognize that you are sovereign. There is nothing that you can't do. And I pray, God, that as you change Job's life in this second speech, I pray you would change our lives as well. We love you, and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, we talked a little bit about the fear of God. When we suffer, what is it that we need? Do we need that suffering to go away? It's perfectly fine to ask God to take away sufferings in our lives. But sometimes, in fact, all the time as we're going through sufferings, what we need more than anything is we need God's wisdom. God's wisdom doesn't mean that it's going to automatically be taken away from us, but what it does mean is that as we're going through difficult experiences, we can respond to the sufferings in a way that is pleasing to God, in a way that God can use us however he sees fit. I mentioned before that the book of Job is poetry, and the very middle verses of the book of Job help us to understand what the purpose of the book is. And in Job 28, 28, it says these words, And he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. And so if we want wisdom in our lives, how should we respond as we go through challenging circumstances, sufferings, adversity, trials, and storms? How do we have wisdom? The fear of the Lord and turning away from evil. To fear God doesn't mean that we just shriek in terror over the thought of God, but what it means is that we reverence him, we stand in awe of him, we respect him in his position. What it means is that we take him seriously in our lives. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is remembering who God is, not who we want him to be. 
So we don't change who God is to fit our situation, but God is God, and he is always the same. And God revealed himself in a whirlwind to Job to teach him what it means to fear him. So last week, as we saw six reasons to fear the God of the whirlwind, I want to go through those just real quickly. Only God constructed the universe. Only God limits the seas and the oceans. Only God commands the sun and its light. Only God possesses eternal knowledge. Only God controls the weather and the planets. And only God sustains all of the animal world. That's from chapters 38 and 39. That was God's first speech, but he wasn't done yet. And so today I want to give you three more reasons to fear the God of the whirlwind. And I want you to get this here because it's extremely important. A lot of people claim that they're Christians, but they don't live in the fear of the Lord. They don't live in a way that they take God seriously, but the choices they make, the The behaviors that they have, if you observe them, it doesn't appear that they fear anything except maybe man's opinion of them. And so some people have a religion where all it is about is about trying to make appearances, trying to look like they're religious, trying to look like they're a good person. That's not what the fear of God is. And so today, if you didn't get it through the first six, I got three more reasons we should fear this God. The first of which is found in verses Uh, 1 through 5 of Job chapter 40, and and really on to verse 14, but it is this, that only God judges righteously. Only God judges righteously. So the first thought under this is that God wants our absolute surrender. God's not interested in you giving just a, a little here and a little there. What God wants more than anything else is for us to absolutely surrender before him. After God's first speech to Job in which he said all those six things that I had covered a minute ago, what do we see? We see that God called Job a fault finder. God said to Job, do you really find fault in me? And then Job responded by saying, I am of small account. I am a little ant basically compared to how big you are. And Job took his hand and he put it over his mouth. Then at the end of chapter, this his second speech in Job chapter 42, we're going to see that in just a little bit, we see Job respond completely different. It wasn't just a matter of him saying, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth and I'm a little person, God. When Job heard God's second speech, something struck the heart. Something changed in him where he recognized, God, I now see who you are. I now know who you are. And it wasn't just a matter of him feeling small and standing in awe of God. He repented of his sin. He saw the holiness of God. And in seeing the holiness of God, he saw the sinfulness of himself. And in such, he said, I need to turn from my sin. I had heard of you with my ear, but now I see you with my eyes. And I need to turn away. After his first speech, Job was not yet broken. And the reason he was not yet broken is because his unanswered questions still bothered him. So there might be some of you here today that you are going through struggles or have gone through struggles maybe even decades ago. Things that have hurt you, things that have bothered you. And maybe at the time you were questioning God, saying, God, why did this happen? God, are you really being fair to me to let this thing happen in my life? I've been hurt so deeply by this. And maybe you went to church. Maybe you had good, well-meaning Christian friends. And they patted you on the back and they told you things like, God is good. God is righteous. You're going to be okay. I'm going to pray for you. And over time, you just moved on. Maybe some of the suffering subsided, but you were still hurting deep within. And that pain that you went through has affected your personality, has affected your relationships. And if you're honest, it's even affected the way that you view God. But what Job experienced here after this second speech was that there was brokenness that took place. Where it was not just a matter of saying the right things just to get through this. God never wants you merely to endure the pain that you're going through. He is working and he has a plan no matter what you're going through. And so Job sees this in the second speech where his heart is absolutely broken and there is absolute surrender. God wants our fear of him to translate into a submissive obedience where we surrender to 
his will and his ways. So I want you to note this. If you are suffering, no matter what that suffering is, and you might make light of it, you might be one of those people that says, well, it could be worse, and so you don't even take your suffering seriously. But I want you to understand that if you are suffering, God's working on you. God has a plan through your pain. He wants you to trust him and for you to stop fighting against him. He wants you to be still and know that he alone is God, not you. He knows what's best, not you. He wants your absolute surrender. So we need to stop holding on to things that are rooted in our unbelief. And so you can say the right things with your lips, but not believe them in our hearts. If you're suffering, it is a call of Almighty God for you to surrender and allow him to be him. But there's a second thought here about how only God judges rightly, righteously. Not only does God want our absolute surrender, but God has never, ever wronged you. There's never been a point in your life where God has wronged you. Now, some of you are thinking of things right now. You're like, well, what about that time? Never has God wronged you. Job gets an audience with Almighty God. And I want you to see here in verses 6 through 8 that the reason why God keeps speaking is because Job's heart is not quite right. In verse 8, listen to what God says to Job. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? So, Job, you're fighting with me, insisting you're right and I'm wrong, is what God's saying. Job, you're, up, up, you're down there on earth, and you're saying that I'm guilty of doing wrong against you. These questions are a big reason why God kept speaking. You would have thought after chapter 38 and 39, that would have been enough for Job to repent, turn back to God. But God kept talking because his heart wasn't quite right. And some of our hearts are not quite right either. Author Max Lucado said this, that Job is a peasant telling the king how to run the kingdom. Job is an illiterate telling E.E. E. Cummings to capitalize his personal pronouns. Job is the bat boy telling Babe Ruth to change his batting stance. Job is the clay telling the potter, don't press so hard. See, Job wanted an audience with God because he felt that God had done him wrong. Job thought he was righteous and he wasn't getting what he deserved. Maybe he thought, I know some people who are wicked. I know some people who worship idols. God, why didn't you put those sores on those people? Why didn't you take their kids away? Haven't I been good? Haven't I tried to do my best, God? And so he was saying to God, I think you got the wrong guy here. Why am I the one suffering and not those people? And sometimes that can go in our heads as well, where you think, I went to church so many times, I tried to raise my kids in church, I try not to do the bad stuff my friends are doing. And we think somehow that because of that, we deserve God's favor and we deserve all of God's blessings and everything to go perfect in our lives. Job was suggesting that he wasn't getting what he deserved. And he was right about that. If we got God's justice, we would spend eternity separated from God. That's what we deserve. We deserve nothing more than death, hell, and the grave. Our very breath that we breathe is a gift from God. And when you feel like God has wronged you, you are really the one that has the wrong perspective. And here's the reason why. This might be just a huge revelation to some of you, okay? So grip the few. You ready for this? This world is not about you. It's not. It's not about you. The planets do not revolve around you. The birds do not sing praises to your name. This world is not about you. God does nothing wrong. And when we say God is good all the time, all the time God is good, that's not just a, a little phrase that we say to make ourselves feel better. It's truth. And the difference between how we respond to truth changes everything. If we just say it with our lips but we don't believe it in our hearts, there's not truly an encounter of God. 
And when God doesn't encounter us with his, with his truth and we just merely say things, we're deceiving ourselves and we're sticking to the situations that we're in. We're still going to have the same heart that Job has here, blaming God for what we think God should have done. But we forget God is who God is, not who we want him to be. And so God has never wronged us. A third thought here about how God judges righteously is that God is perfectly holy. God is perfectly holy. You see this in verses 9 through 14. We need to be careful saying that God is unfair to us. To say God is unfair is to say that God is unjust and that God is unholy. So Job here is a finite man and he is telling Almighty God that he's not doing his job right. It's basically what he's doing. So God says, well, let me see if you're qualified to do better. So what he does in verses 9 through 14 is he goes through his characteristics and he says, Job, it seems that that you're not God in this area. You're not like me in this area, but yet you are such a finite person. You're telling me that I'm doing my job wrong. So here's how he does it. Verse 9, he says, let's have an arm wrestling contest. Let me see your arm. An arm is a symbol of strength. You've been in the weight room lately, Job? Let's go. Let's see if you're strong enough to beat me in an arm wrestling contest. Of course not. Well, let me hear your voice, Job. God's thundering voice is a reference to his sovereign authority over all of the universe. Your voice can't compare to my voice, Job. I'm the voice of the whirlwind. I'm the voice that said, let there be light, and there was light. And then he said, let me look at your clothes. Are you wearing majesty, dignity, glory, and splendor? No, those are things that only Almighty God wears. And you're not wearing those things, so you're not qualified to tell me what to do. Tell me how I'm supposed to run the universe. Let me see how you would righteously judge the proud, he says in 11 through 14. Are you holy, perfectly holy? Do you have any biases? Are you perfectly wise? No. Only God is perfectly holy, and only God judges righteously. So, jumping from this, God says to him, if you think you can judge the proud, let me bring out a couple big creatures who are very proud, and I'll let you judge them. And it brings to this second thought here, this second response, why we should fear God. Because not only is only God the one that judges righteously, but only God made the most fearsome creatures. Only God made the most fearsome creatures. God challenged Job to show his power, his wisdom to judge these proud creatures. And these are two of God's most fearsome creatures that you will ever read about, the behemoth and the leviathan. There's a lot of discussion about these creatures. Are they real? Are they mythological? Are they symbols of something else? What is a behemoth? What is a leviathan? And I think one of the best clues is found in Job chapter 40, verse 15. In speaking about the behemoth, this is what God says. Behold, that is consider, think out deeply, the behemoth. Note, what does it say next? Which I made as I made you. So this is important to consider. God made this behemoth, and we're going to talk about the behemoth in just a moment. God made this massive behemoth, and he also made you. So I believe these are real creatures that existed. In addition to that, in chapter 39, God listed a lot of animals that really did exist. So I think that these two creatures are true, not mythological creatures. Chapter 40 is dedicated to the behemoth. And in chapter 41, there are 34 verses that describe this mysterious Leviathan. So, what is a behemoth? What is a behemoth? The word is a transliteration of a Hebrew word that means a super beast. Now, there are a lot of interpretations and theories about what exactly this is. Some people have said it's an elephant or a a rhinoceros that doesn't have a horn. Some people see it as a water buffalo or some type of dinosaur or an extinct animal. But the most common identification is that of a hippopotamus. Okay? 
In fact, there is a paraphrase of the Bible that actually doesn't even put the word behemoth in there, but they put the word hippopotamus in there. So this, if you look at your commentaries, most of them will say that. Now, we're going to get back to the behemoth in just a minute, but what is a leviathan? What is a leviathan? The word is a transliteration of a Hebrew word, which means to twist. The word is used to describe the sea monsters that were supposedly in the Mediterranean Sea. The Leviathan is spoken about in three Old Testament scriptures, and you're welcome to compare those scriptures to this one if you wanted to. But some people see it as a dragon, as a whale, as a dolphin, or as a marine dinosaur. But the most common identification, just like in that paraphrase, is that of a crocodile. Now, I've read a lot about these creatures, and remember that this passage is poetry. So there's some descriptions about them where you start reading about the Leviathan in chapter 41 and you're like, I've never seen a crocodile that was shooting fire out of his mouth. Never seen that before, so obviously it can't be a crocodile. But again, there's some poetic imagery that's used here. It could be that the saliva as he comes up from his mouth comes from his nose and from his mouth. And so there are different possibilities And I'm not saying 100% certain that that's what the creature was and that's what the behemoth is. I don't know that. So it's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is. I might get some of that poetry wrong. But I do know that these are real creatures. And the point of chapters 40 and 41 is not that we know exactly what type of creature it is. But the point of the chapter is that these creatures terrify man. If you get yourself in a situation where you're before a leviathan or a behemoth, you are going to be terrified. I don't care who you are. So there are three truths that we can glean from their descriptions. Number one, God controls what we fear. God controls what we fear. Now again, these are great verses and I encourage you to read them and do your own independent study. I'm not going to go through every single verse going back and forth on what kind of animal this possibly could be. I'm not a biologist. I'm not even good at any of those things. You can look at that on your own time if you want to. But the point is, is that these creatures are far bigger than Job. They're far stronger than Job and any of us. People see these creatures and they wet their loincloths, right? Their weapons, their weapons are of no avail. It doesn't matter what you have. It's not going to help against these kind of creatures. They're not going to listen to Job. They're not going to listen to you. You can't take them home as pets. You don't take them and put them in the playpen with your little girl. No, these are monsters. These are crazy, strong creatures. In fact, in Job chapter 40, verse 19, this is one verse that speaks about the fact that only God controls them. It says there he is the first of the works of God. This is the behemoth. It means that he is one of the greatest works of God in his size alone. Let him who made him, that's God, bring, him, bring near his sword. God is the one that can subdue this massive creature. So I don't know if you like to watch Animal Planet, the TV show. And every now and then Animal Planet will have specials. Some people like to watch Shark Week. Some people like to watch a show called The World's Deadliest Animals. Now, I want you to understand there's nothing wrong with watching those shows, and you can watch them and actually be entertained by them, right? But if that's you, experience them in the wild, if you're in a boat surrounded by those sharks, it's kind of a different story, isn't it? If you're out in the jungle face-to-face with a terrifying creature, whatever it might would be, maybe you're thinking of a, a huge bear, maybe you're thinking of a, a lion or a tiger or something that is just ferocious, maybe you have bad dreams every night and it's always the same animal, whatever the situation. Whatever the situation. Imagine yourself being in that spot. Now, are you going to be confident? Are you going to strut in front of this animal and say, let's go, let's go, I got gotcha. you? No, you're going to be terrified I myself don't like big dogs that are without a leash. I don't like them. One time I was uh, doing outreach with a buddy and uh, we drove into the driveway and there was a dog that was big. He must have been, I don't know, 700 pounds as far as I know. He he was huge, (laughs) foaming at the mouth, you know. And and this big dog was was barking and, and I don't speak dog, right? 
But, but I feel like what he said to me was, this is not your house. If you open that door, I'm going to eat your leg off. All right? That, that's, what I, that's what I was hearing, right? And so we didn't share Jesus with that family. I mean, we just scooted back and we prayed for him, Lord, send somebody else because we're, we're scared. <laughs> um, Maybe you would have been the same way. I'm not taking any chances with those animals. They can smell my fear, and, and I must have stunk. But as fearful as we are of some animals, the Leviathan and the behemoth are described in these chapters as the most fearful of God's creation. So whatever you think of as a, a fearful animal, something that would terrify you if you were face-to-face -face locked in a cage with one of these things, that's the point, is God wants you to see an animal that is in absolute terror, of, you're in terror of this animal, that's where God wants you right now. That's where God got Job right now, okay? So are you with me? You have no hope of survival against an animal like that. God tells Job that he is in control of these creatures. Job is not in control. If God can control the very things that you are terrified of, don't you think that God is in control of the situations and circumstances that are terrifying you right now? The one thing that is going to challenge your faith more than anything else in this world is fear. You're afraid to do what God wants you to do. You're afraid to talk to your neighbor. You're afraid to really give your all to Jesus. And Jesus is telling us right now, he controls everything that we're afraid of. If he can control that monster, that, that, that creature that's just fangs, if he can control that, don't you think he can control circumstances as well? He's got your life under control. The call is to trust him. And so God controls what we fear, but it doesn't stop there. God also owes no one. He owes no one. If you look in chapter 41, as God is describing the Leviathan, as he is beginning to describe him, he just stops midway through this description of the Leviathan. And this is what he says. No one, verse 10, no one is so furious that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him. Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. And then he goes and describes the Leviathan even more. If you happen to sneak up on a huge crocodile and said, hey, I'm going to wake up that crocodile, that would not be a smart move. You can imagine a crocodile being extremely angry and probably snapping at you. How dare you interrupt my rest? You wouldn't provoke one of those fearsome creatures. But why are we so bold to provoke God to anger by saying that he is unfair or God is mistreating us or God is not doing what we think he should be doing in our life at this exact moment? We provoke him to anger. Everything we have is because of God. He owes us nothing. God does not owe you an explanation for the reason you are suffering. If you read the book of Job, Nowhere do we see the exact reason why Job was suffering. God did not owe Job that explanation. God does not owe you a reward for your righteousness. And so if you're here at church today thinking, because I came to church today, I imagine by Tuesday of this week, somebody's going to send me a check for a lot of money because I was a good person and God rewards me for doing good. That's not how it works. God doesn't owe us anything. You can't bargain with him. God is never in our debt. We don't earn God's blessings because we try to be good. God owes no one. But as you continue to see in that passage, that God also owns everything. He owns everything. Job 41, 11, the second part says, Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. This creator has absolutely no fear over these massive creatures. If God Almighty sees the behemoth, he sees the Leviathan, he sees it like he sees one of us. They are strong, but God is stronger. They are big, but God is bigger. So yes, a behemoth or a Leviathan or other fearsome creatures, they can take your life, but God is in control over our souls. Who do we fear more? If we disrespect the strength of one of these creatures, we will pay the consequence. How much more, then, will we pay the consequence when we live in a way that does not respect 
the creator of these fearsome creatures. Some people treat God like they are one of these fearsome creatures. It is wisdom to stay away from their habitat. I have no interest in swimming in the marshes with the, the crocodiles, right? I, I just have no desire to do that. I'm, I'm crazy, but not there, right? <laughs> but, but the point of this is that some people think that they treat God like that. Oh, I'm just going to avoid God. I don't have to deal with him. I can avoid the, the, the ocean monster. I can avoid the huge hippopotamus. I don't have to ever see them. I could stay in my nice little hoax bluff area in my nice little home, and I could sing to God, and everything's fine. I'll never have to worry about animals like that. So we treat God like that. But the Bible says that it's appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment. So I want you to understand this, that God is unavoidable. There will come a time where you will stand before the creator of those fearsome beasts. You can avoid those crazy big animals, but you can never avoid God. You will stand before him. And this is what the Bible says. If you see it in verse 10, the second part says, Who then is he who could stand before me? We stand before God and we don't stand. We fall on our face because he is a massive, almighty God. Who can stand before him? God owns everything, those fearsome creatures, and he even owns us. At least those fearsome creatures know to submit to God, and yet we have the nerve to disrespect our creator. And that leads me to this third thought, that this awesome, powerful God that we, that we can't even stand before, that is so amazingly awesome and beautiful and big and strong, stronger than anything we can imagine with our minds, the God who created all the universe and sustains the universe that has that much wisdom, that much power, here's the amazing thing, is that he wants you. He wants you. He wants a relationship with you. And he is doing whatever he can do to draw you to him. And he wants you to understand this truth, that he's big in size, but he's big in love. And so he humbles us with his presence. And we see this in Job chapter 42. This is how Job responded to God's second speech. God humbled him. And I want to share with you that a couple of thoughts here. Number one, that God encounters us in our brokenness. Sometimes we resist being broken. We're proud people. We don't want to get on our knees. We don't want to confess our wrongs. We don't want to turn from our bad habits, or our mistakes as we call them. But God can work with the broken. Job responds to God's first speech by calling himself a small account and covering his mouth. But after his second speech, Job is completely surrendered. Let me read these verses, Job 42, 1 through 6. Job answered the Lord and said, this is after God said, look Think about the behemoth. Think about the Leviathan. And so he says in verse 2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I've uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now... My eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is where God wants us. So what is the difference between the first speech and the second speech? I believe Job was not yet fully broken. As, God saw, as Job saw God's power revealed in a whirlwind, he heard God's thunderous voice of who he is. Job's pride was utterly extinguished. He realized that his life is not about himself. And that's a hard lesson for all of us to learn. Try teaching that to a toddler. Well, in all honesty, grown adults are not much different from a toddler. We want to live for ourselves, do what we want to do, and we disrespect authority. God is the ultimate authority, and he is trying to get our attention Verse 5 is one of my favorite verses, really in all of the Bible. He says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. And I want you to get this here today. Job could not have said that if it weren't for the sores, if it weren't for the loss, if it weren't for his kids dying. Job would have never said that. 
Job had to lose in order to see God, in order to experience him in a real and fresh way. When God is encountering you through your sufferings, you don't leave unchanged. You have a deeper appreciation, a deeper fear of God. The idea of verse 5 is that Job now has spiritual sight by this encounter with the living God. The God who created the behemoth and the Leviathan. This is the God who is drawing near to me. He cares for me. He loves me. What is man that God is mindful of us? But yet he is. He is. Job says, I had heard of you before. My family told me about God. I read about you in a book. I was raised in a surrounding where God talk happened all the time. But now, it's not just about hearing you. It's not just about hearing other people's testimonies. Now I myself know you. I myself have experienced you. You, almighty God, have encountered me, and I am forever changed. Therefore, I surrender. What do I hold back in a, before a God like this? I've heard of you, but now I know you. I've tasted and seen that you are good. God's revelation of himself reveals who we truly are. When we experience his holiness, we cannot live the same way. God's revelation always leads to transformation. We begin to fear him. Job saw God's holiness and his questions no longer mattered. Whereas after the first speech, he was holding on, saying, God, I I still don't understand. I still don't get it. Now when he sees his holiness, he says, you know what? I don't understand, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is your presence. All that matters was surrender. And that's what Job did. In verse 2, the first part, Job learned that God is omnipotent. I know that you can do all things. And it's not just a matter of, I believe that because I've been taught I'm supposed to believe that. No, I know that in my heart. I experience it, that you're an almighty, all-powerful God, omnipotent. Second part of verse 2, Job learned about God's sovereignty. Look what it says there. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. So no flesh can come up to God and say, hey, let's, let's negotiate about the sufferings in my life. No purpose of God can be thwarted. Not even Satan himself can thwart God's plans. God is sovereign. He's in control. Even when our lives are spiraling out of control, God is still in control, still on his throne. And then in verse 3, Job quotes things that God had told him, and Job learned that God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. Job does not understand everything, and really he understands very little, but God knows everything. And so if this God is a powerful God, and he is, if this God is a sovereign God, and he is, if this God is an all-knowing God, and he is, the call is for us to trust him. Stop fighting him. Stop striving against him. Stop striving and saying, God, I just don't understand. He says, it's okay, I do. I do. And I know that it hurts, but I'm here. That leads to this second important thought about how God humbles us with his presence. It is this, that God gives grace to those that are humbled. God gives grace to the humble. Job got to a point where his questions did not need answers. And there are some of you that, if we're being honest, you're still shaking your fist at God. And you think that somehow you're justified to do that. You need to get to a point where you say, all that matters is you, God. Not even my understanding. God recognized that all Job, Job recognized that all he needed was God's presence. The Apostle Paul was another righteous man who went through some difficult times. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that there was a thorn in his flesh. And you know what he did? He said, God, take this away from me three times. Take that thorn away from me. We don't know exactly what it is. It really doesn't matter. But every time God said, no. No. Take this thorn away from me, God. No. It hurts so much, God. Take it away. No. God, please, no. With a cherry on top, no. God said no. But here's what he did say. In verse 9, God's, Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. 
For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Both Job and Paul had an encounter with God to show them that God's grace is all that they need. All that they need is God's grace. They don't need the suffering to go away because God is doing something in the suffering. We come to the end of ourselves when we come face to face with God, the encounter. As long as you're proud, as long as you're rebellious, you're not going to have that encounter. You're running away like you're hiding from some behemoth. There's a Leviathan outside. I'm not going to go to God. God sees you. He knows you. And he's calling you to allow him to mold you. And When we suffer, don't blame God. Don't be complacent and say, oh, it is what it is. Know that God is working. He wants you to experience more of him. He wants you to taste that his grace is enough. It's all that you need. You don't need more happiness and more comfort and more pleasure. That's what a lot of people are living for, more success and more money. God says you need more of me. You need my presence. And until you're broken, you're running from it. Listen, you don't have to suffer like Job. You don't have to have a thorn in the flesh like Paul to learn this. Some of us, myself included, sometimes it takes stuff like that for me to finally wake up. Some of you are being encountered by God right now through his word. And if God is encountering you, Respond the way that Job responded. How did he respond? Look at verse 6 again. Job 42, 6. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job responded by despising himself, and that doesn't talk about self-pity, but really he despised his self-righteousness. He despised his pride that he had coming before an almighty God, demanding that God give him answers. And he repented. To repent is a change of mind that results in a change of behavior. It's not enough merely to know, yeah, I did wrong, but it's what are you going to do differently? And when God encounters you, whether it be through suffering, through his word, when God encounters you, we respond and we say, woe is me, for I am a sinful man, but there Jesus is. There he forgives you. There he cleanses you. There he takes your sin as far as the east is from the west. And there you had heard of him with your ears, but now you see him with your eyes. You have a new and fresh experience you had never had before, but it takes brokenness to get there. Job learned that. It is wisdom to fear God. Today we've seen three more reasons to fear the God of the whirlwind. Only God judges righteously. Only God made these fearsome creatures. And only God humbles us with his presence. So at this time I want to invite our musicians to come to the stage. And I want to invite our counselors to come to this door. We are going to have a time of response. How does God want you to respond to this message that you've heard today? Do you need to be saved? One day you will stand before him. And this great, mighty God that we stand before, the Bible says no one can stand before him. We are all guilty in our sin. We can't negotiate and say, oh, you know, it wasn't that bad that I did there. No, we've lived a life of rebellion against a holy God. There's no bargaining with him. We all deserve his judgment. And the incredible thing is, is that this great God that we serve, he loves us. He loves us so very much that the Bible says that the wrath of God that we deserve because of our sin was put upon Jesus on the cross. The reason why Jesus died on the cross for our sins is because we deserve God's judgment. We deserve death for our sins, but Jesus died 
for us. He took our place. That's the kind of love that this awesome and powerful God has for you. And you might say, well, I've done so much wrong. That's what the cross is for. All of the wrong, all of the death that you deserve, that's why Jesus died for you. And others of you might say, well, I haven't done much wrong at all. I'm a pretty good person. Don't be deceived. The Bible says that all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And you say, well, I haven't done what they've done, and I haven't done what they've done. You see what you're doing? You're comparing yourself to others. The Bible says we should compare ourselves to God. Do you match up to his holiness? Do you match up to his perfection? No, we all fall short. We're all condemned in our sin. But when you believe that Jesus is God's son and died on the cross for you and rose from the dead and you surrender before him and say, Jesus, be boss, Lord, commander, master of my life, whatever word you want to say, I just surrender before you. I believe in you. I believe you died. I believe you rose. And I'm asking you to save me today. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, it's not a matter of just knowing things about God. Some of you had heard about God with your ears, but you've never seen him with your eyes. When you're saved, you have that new experience. It's not a matter of going through motions. It's not a matter of impressing other people by your attendance at church. It's a matter of knowing him. And the God who created all of the universe and sustains all of the universe wants a relationship with you. It's amazing. So as we have a time of response, if you need to be saved, I want to invite you to come forward. I'll be here at the front of the stage here. We'll have great counselors over here. You can come to them, and you can just say, I don't know that I'm saved or I need to be saved, and they'll be glad to share with you how you can know Jesus today. For others of you here today, I know you're struggling. I know you have adversity and trials going on in your life, and you're frustrated. You're discouraged. You don't know what to do, and the Bible tells us what we're supposed to do. You ready for it? to cast our cares on God because he cares for us. We'll have this altar open if you need to come and pray. Whatever it is, you don't have to make it public. God knows your heart. Whatever you're struggling with, if you want to come to the altar and pray, you can do that. You can pray right where you are if that's what God wants you to do. Others of you here need to go to a counselor to ask questions about how to be a church member or how to know that you're saved or what, why should I get baptized? And so maybe you have other questions going on. That's why we have these counselors over here. I'll be in the front. This God of the whirlwind has spoken to us. He has encountered us. So how are we going to respond? Let's all stand together. Jeff and the praise team are going to lead us in song. And the call today is to come to Jesus. As a wretch, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, free my soul For the first time
took my place Laid inside my tomb of sin You were buried for three days But then you walked right out again And now death has no sting And life has no end For I have been transformed By the blood of the Lamb Thank you, Jesus, for the blood
That's so good. Amen. Amen. Don't just say it with your mouth, believe it in your heart. So great to have you today, and uh, thank you guests for being here. It would mean a lot to me and, uh, and to the church if you did connect with us through that card. We'd appreciate it. Please be sure to take a note at your worship guide. There are w words of announcement that are there, ministry opportunities as well. Today is one of those days. Uh, at 3.30, the ministry bus is going to be here. We're asking volunteers to come at 3 o'clock. This is a great opportunity to minister to our community, to help people. We're giving out uh, food and other items, and so this would just be a great opportunity for you to show the love of Christ. Also tonight, there's a senior adult Bible study at room 116, and then Celebrate Recovery meal starts at 5, and then small group at 6 and large at 7. Is there a word? Okay. You're welcome. All right. And so if you want to help out with this, the bus today, come at 2.30, And then November 20th is a day to circle on your calendar for the Thanksgiving meal at the school. Great ministry opportunities. Another ministry opportunity is our Operation Christmas Child. We have shoeboxes still available. You can turn them in turn them in outside here uh, to my right and the shoe box you can turn them in whenever but our collection dates are November 13th through the 20th is there any other word about that yeah absolutely bring them on in yes please by Sunday be in the deadline and uh, don't procrastinate if you if you can all right is there another word all right. Well, God bless you for being here. It's been great to be in the house of the Lord. So glad to see you, and I hope that you have a blessed afternoon. And so let's all stand. Brother Jeff and the praise band are going to sing us out. Have a wonderful afternoon. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Oh, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. God will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Oh, let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. No, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall that can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do.
nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing.